In this tutorial we're going to look at resistance. The first aim is explain why circuit components heat up, then describe how thermistors and LDRs work, that's light dependent resistors, and then finally explain and apply Ohm's law. Now we've already looked at the idea that resistance is an opposition to current, so the more resistance there is in a circuit, the slower the current. So you might be tricked into thinking that resistance is a bad thing, but sometimes resistance is very useful indeed. For example, these days many lights are fitted with dimmer switches. These are devices that increase and decrease the resistance to change the flow of current. That changes the brightness of a bulb. You may also see resistors like this on stereos and amplifiers, on TVs, anything which has a volume switch, because the principle is the same. These switches increase the resistance or lower the resistance to change the volume. That's due to the size of current, again. The more current that flows through our speaker, the louder it is. So these are examples of variable resistors. These are circuit components that we can vary the resistance of, and subsequently it affects the current. But resistance can also be a bad thing. For example, you may have noticed that when you plug an electrical appliance in, it starts to heat up, and heating can lead to problems. Sometimes heating is exactly the effect we want. Heaters have a high resistance to current, and therefore they heat up, and we can benefit from that. But sometimes heat is a sign of inefficiency. For example, light bulbs, we just want light out of our light bulbs, but a lot of energy is wasted as heat. This is due to a light bulb having a high resistance to current. You may also notice that when you plug in an electronic device's charger, it also heats up. This is another sign of inefficiency. This is wasted energy. And it's a sign that not all the energy is being devoted to charging up our device. But sometimes heating problems can have a really severe impact on our devices. A few years ago, a certain games console suffered from overheating problems so much that parts inside the console started to melt and many people had to return their systems. To protect ourselves from the dangers of overheating, electronic devices are fitted with something called a fuse. A fuse is a very thin piece of wire, a weak link in the circuit, and if too much heat basically warms up that wire, it causes it to melt and the circuit breaks and prevents electric shocks. But the key question here, and the one you need to carry forward into an exam, is why do electrical appliances heat up when a current flows through them? You have to explain this. Well, I said that resistance is the opposition to current. And if you remember, current is the flow of electrons, so these yellow particles represent electrons flowing through the wire. But the charged atomic nuclei of metal atoms, which we'll just call ions here because they're positively charged particles, they don't move so much, they just vibrate slowly on the spot. So when describing resistance or the cause of, these are the two particles we need to think about. Electrons, these little yellow dots, and positively charged ions, these pink um, circles. But before we explain any further, let's use an analogy. You may have heard of a game called Bulldog. In the game Bulldog, you basically stand on one side of a football pitch and you have to run to the other side while someone has to catch you in the middle. Now firstly, imagine the catcher is still. It will be very easy for most of these runners to get past. Now let's imagine that catcher can move up and down slightly, so they can move a little bit. The chances are that they'll collide with one of these runners and stop them from moving. Now let's say our catcher's had an energy drink and they're moving very, very quickly indeed. The chances are they're going to collide with more runners and stop them moving. This is pretty much what's happening here, except for this time our runners are the electrons and the person catching are the ions. So let's first assume that our wire is cool, it's just been switched on and the electrons are flowing. Now because the ions don't have much energy, they're not moving very much, so we have a high current. But what happens is, whenever an electron collides with an ion, the collision causes energy transfer. In other words, the kinetic energy in the particles upon the collision is transferred to heat. And this heats up the wire, it heats up the environment. But the key point is these ions start to vibrate on the spot a little bit more, just like our catcher in that bulldog game. So now the electrons are moving, but they're colliding more frequently with these ions, and that slows down the current. And obviously, whenever a collision occurs, more heat is released. So now our wire is hot. So now these ions will be moving very quickly because they're overheated, they have a lot of kinetic energy, and that will cause more and more collisions between the electrons and these vibrating particles. As a result, the resistance is very high and the current is very low, it slows down. 
If this was to continue, then there's a good chance the electronic device will stop working because it's too hot and the current has just ceased to move fast enough to operate the device. So to explain this heating phenomena, you would say electrons in the wire collide with ions in the lattice. A lattice is any structure with a regular arrangement of particles such as these ions in rows. This causes the release of heat energy. The ions move or vibrate faster, causing more collisions. This increases the resistance in the wire, and so the current decreases. This is a very popular topic to test you on an exam, so learn this process. The key idea here is electrons collide with the ions and release heat. This increases resistance, lowering current. So now we can explain why circuit components heat up. So now we'll look at two electronic devices or components that use resistance in a very useful way. These are light dependent resistors, LDRs for short, and thermistors. You need to know the circuit symbol for both, so please make a note of that now. This is what a light dependent resistor looks like. These arrows represent light falling on the resistor, and this is a thermistor. This line represents a change in temperature. Light dependent resistors are useful for many reasons, but one very obvious one is controlling street lamps. You see, when the level of light changes or it goes dark, street lamps switch on. These aren't switched on manually, it happens automatically due to the presence of light dependent resistors in the circuit. Similarly, some swimming pools are controlled by automatic immersion heaters, so when the temperature falls, let's say it's getting dark at night and temperature drops, Heaters in the pool switch on to warm up the water. This again isn't controlled manually, but automatically by the presence of thermistors in the circuit. Now you're not going to need to know a lot about these, you just need to basically describe how they work. You'll never have to fully explain how they work because it's very sophisticated and complex. They work in a similar way. Light dependent resistors work as follows. As light levels increase, the resistance in the circuit decreases. In other words, when it's bright, resistance is low, when it's dark, resistance is high in the light dependent resistor. Thermistors do the same but in terms of temperature, so as temperature increases, the resistance in the thermistor decreases. In other words, if the device is hot, resistance is low, if the device is cool, resistance is high. Now, it's quite easy to get muddled in an exam and forget which way is which, but remember this, remember LDR, light up, resistance down. And just remember for thermistors, it's temperature up, resistance down. And you can see these graphs represent that. So as light intensity is increasing, resistance in the LDR is decreasing. And as temperature is increasing, resistance in the thermistor is decreasing. Now, if you're particularly switched on, you might suddenly realize, hang on, logically, this doesn't make sense. If it's dark, then resistance surely should be low, not high, because if it's low, then the current will flow and switch the light on. Don't worry or get too confused by this. Basically, these circuit components work with other circuit components to switch the lights on. To give you an idea, this isn't exactly how they work, but imagine you had a circuit which suddenly it got dark and the resistance increased. You can imagine the electrons now get redirected to another circuit to switch the light on. And that's how you describe how thermistors and LDRs work. So now we're gonna look at Ohm's law and voltage current graphs. George Ohm was a German physicist and mathematician who realized there's a relationship between resistance voltage and current, and he linked them together in a principle called Ohm's law. What Ohm's law teaches us is there is a directly proportional relationship between voltage and current, assuming that temperature in a circuit is constant. You can test Ohm's law pretty easily. Set up a simple loop circuit with, let's say, a bulb or a fixed resistor in here in series with an ammeter to measure current and a variable resistor. This is assuming you've attached your circuit to a cell rather than a power pack. In parallel with the component you want to measure, be it a bulb or resistor, you have a voltmeter. Voltmeters measure potential difference, the energy which the charge carriers have here compared to the energy they have here, and it works out the difference. So you can use this circuit to work out the relationship between the current flowing through this bulb and the voltage across it. You can vary current and voltage by changing the variable resistor. The higher the resistance, the lower the current, the lower the voltage. Now in this example, let's assume that temperature isn't affected. We know now that if you increase voltage or if you have a current flowing through a wire, temperature will increase. Let's assume for a second that doesn't happen. 
What we would find is a directly proportional relationship between voltage and current. In other words, as you double one, you double the other. So 2 volts gives you 0.1 amps, whereas 4 volts doubled gives you 0.2 amps doubled. Then from 4 to 8 volts doubled, you can see that current goes from 0.2 to 0.4, also doubled. Directly proportional relationships are best seen on graphs because they produce diagonally straight lines. So any line which looks like this on a voltage current graph obeys Ohm's law. It doesn't matter whether the line is steep or shallow or somewhere in the middle, all these lines obey Ohm's law. They show a directly proportional relationship. Now, a reasonable question you may ask with these graphs is why do they go into the negative and what does that mean? Well, don't get confused. Positive just indicates the direction the current's flowing around the circuit. So in this part of the graph, the positive area, we're assuming the current is flowing this way around the circuit. Whereas in the negative, we're assuming either we flip the battery the other way around or switch the pins and now the current is flowing the other way around the circuit. You get the same pattern on either side because the direction in which it flows doesn't impact the resistance or the current. So just remember that assuming that temperature is constant, if you increase voltage, current increases proportionally. However, I said George Ohm was a mathematician, so he expressed his formula or this relationship mathematically using the formula V equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. This is Ohm's law, this formula here. It can be rearranged to current equals voltage divided by resistance or resistance equals voltage divided by current. Normally in exams you have to use this version of the equation, although you must be prepared to use these two as well. So to calculate current you do voltage divided by resistance. Here's a question. If a 3 ohm resistor has a potential difference of 9 volts across it, calculate the current through the resistor. So we know our voltage is 9 volts. We know our resistance is 3 ohms, so we simply do 9 divided by 3 gives you 3 amps. Very easy. But you need to know three voltage current graphs specifically. One is for a fixed resistor. This is the easiest one because it generally obeys Ohm's law. Fixed resistors can take quite a lot of heat before it affects current. So we generally get a directly proportional relationship using the voltages we use in a school lab. So you describe this graph by saying it's a directly proportional relationship between voltage and current. And you could explain it by saying as voltage increases, the electrons have more kinetic energy, so current increases. In other words, the electrons have more of a push, so they move faster. But you get different types of resistors. Some have a high resistance to current, others have a low resistance to current. And that will affect the steepness of the line. It'll either be like this or this, but you'll always get a straight diagonal line indicating a directly proportional relationship. The next one, which requires the most explaining, is a filament lamp. You'll notice it starts off much like the resistor, but at the end it curves this way and down below curves this way. This implies that as we continue to increase voltage, the current isn't increasing as much, not proportionally anymore. Every increase in voltage leads to a slight decrease in current, so it starts to level off. This suggests that resistance must be increasing in the circuit at high voltages. So, to describe it, at first there is a proportional relationship between voltage and current. That's about up to here. You can see it's a straight line up to here. Then, as voltage continues to increase over here, overheating causes resistance to increase. Remember that overheating is due to more collisions between the electrons and the ions in a wire. As a result, the current decreases. And that's how you explain this. So here, increasing voltage, current is also increasing because the electrons are moving faster. But after a while, there's so many collisions between the electrons and the ions that the current starts to decrease, even as we continue increasing voltage. After a while, we could continue to increase voltage and there'll be no further increase in current. Finally, we'll look at the less familiar diode. Don't be worried by a diode. Even though it looks alien, it's actually the easiest one to explain. A diode has a circuit component symbol like this, and what it's telling you is it allows current to flow in one direction, but not the other direction. There's a block in the other direction. In other words, diodes have a very high resistance to current in one direction and a very low resistance to current in the other direction. Diodes are useful in circuit boards to ensure that current flows in one direction only, preventing damage to the circuit board. 
So the point here is a diode only allows current to flow in one direction around the circuit. So you will recognize the diode graph instantly because the line will only be in either the positive or the negative, but never both. You'll never have to explain this little uh, stall before it increases either. That's quite high level physics. One very important final consideration. Sometimes in exams, they reverse the voltage and current on the axes. So the current is down here and the voltage is up there. Be aware that even though this shows the same thing as these explanations, the line will look slightly different. For example, filament lamps will now show the curve going upwards rather than horizontally. And a diode, it will look like this rather than this. It's exactly the same principle, it's just the shape changes because you've reversed voltage and current. Look out for that because it has thrown students in the past. That's how you explain and apply Ohm's law.